So welcome to our celebration this morning, the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany, February the 13th. <laughs> Somebody's not muted. We acknowledge that we meet today on the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. May we dwell on this land with respect and peace. Rejoice and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. O God of peace, who taught us that in returning and rest, we shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence where we may still and know that you are God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing our joy now as we sing along with Judy, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, whose Son Jesus Christ healed the sick and restored them to wholeness of life, look with compassion on the anguish of the world, and by your power make whole all peoples and nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, 
whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in, live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. We say the refrain, happy are they who trust in the Lord together. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seat of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. Happy are they who trust in the Lord. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither, everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Happy are they who trust in the Lord. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the, of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Happy are they who trust in the Lord. Giver of life, save us from the desert of faithlessness and nourish us with the living waters of your word that we may bring forth fruit that will last in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. And a reading from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him. For power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. 
Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, <clears throat> and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It was quite a few years ago now that I was once talking to a member of the parish I was in at the time. And this was a good member. He was, uh, he was very involved. He was involved in the leadership of the parish. He was involved in our worship. He was always in church. But this day, he confided to me that he could not bring himself to say the creeds in church. He just could not bring himself to say the creeds in church. Because there was too much there, he said, that was just strange, too much that was unbelievable, too much that was totally ridiculous from his point of view. Things, you know, like, like the virgin birth, or being the son of God in that sense, or the resurrection. He just could not believe himself, could not bring himself to believe all of that, and so he could not even say them in church. So we had a wonderful conversation about it. And the thing is that there are many like him in the church. There are many who find some of these things very difficult to hold on to, difficult to understand, and very difficult to believe. And that's why every now and again, somebody comes along and tries to demythologize the Christian faith. And that's just demythologize. That's just a big word, which means they're trying to take out all of the spooky stuff. They're trying to take out all of the weird stuff, all of the unbelievable stuff. They're trying to explain away the miracles. They're trying to explain away the strangeness. They're trying to, trying to explain away sometimes, especially the resurrection. After all, we know perfectly well, you and I, people when they're dead for three days, they do not rise again. So it doesn't happen usually, and so it could not have happened this time, and therefore they try to explain it in a whole variety of ways. I've heard ordained clergy say, well, it wasn't a resuscitation. It wasn't a real resurrection in that sense. It was a spiritual resurrection, um, which I have never entirely understood. But their intentions are good. They're trying to make the faith more accessible. They're trying not to drive people away by these things that seem to be superstition and so passe. And they're trying to make us think. So in that sense, it is a good thing. But they don't seem to realize that when they do this, when they demythologize, when they take out these spooky bits, the strange bits, the different bits, those parts that are hard to understand, what they are also taking out is all of the power and all of the joy and all of the wonder of our faith. They're taking out all of the power and the joy and the wonder. And it's even worse when they're trying to take away the reality of the resurrection, the reality that Jesus was actually killed on the cross, that he died exactly as you and I would die in that situation, and that he was buried and that on the third day, God rose, raised him from the dead, that he was raised physically strongly enough that his disciples could touch him, that they could eat with him, that they could be with him, walk with him, hold him. When they try to de deny that, when they try to explain it away, then St. Paul says they are attacking the very foundation of the faith. They do not seem to understand that if it were proved somehow that Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, if it were proved somehow, and I have no idea how that could be proved, but if it were proved somehow that he in fact died and was buried and stayed in the tomb, then the Christian faith would fail, it would vanish, it would evaporate, because the foundation of it would be gone, it would collapse entirely. 
Paul says, if there was no resurrection, if the resurrection did not really happen, then our faith is in vain and what we believe is futile. It's pointless. And he says, we are all of all people most to be pitied. We're sort of like, sort of like we would pity those poor people who actually still believe the world is flat, delusional, and you don't take them seriously. You just laugh at them a little bit and pity them. And Paul says, if the resurrection did not happen, then that is who we are. More than that, the Beatitudes that Jesus taught, the, the reading that we heard this morning, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, blessed are those who weep now, they would become a mockery because if there is no resurrection, then we are not resurrected and we are stuck in this life and that's all there is. And all that these Beatitudes are is a sort of pie in the sky when you die thing. It makes Christianity into exactly the opiate of the masses that Marx believed that it was. It's just a way to hold people down, to keep them content with their lot, to keep them content with the oppression that they live in, in order that they will not bother those who are rich, those who are in control. But, but, in fact, Paul says, in fact, Christ was raised. Jesus was raised from the dead. That was the one thing that those apostles, those early disciples of Jesus, were absolutely sure of, were absolutely convinced of. There was nothing that could stop them. I mean, they were transformed from a group of people who were hiding for fear of the authorities into an unstoppable band that charged out across the face of the world and transformed the world that was there and continue to transform our world. And why could they do that? Why did they do that? Why were they so changed? Because they understood, they saw, they knew that Jesus had been raised from the dead, that he had faced the worst that this world could throw at him. They had, he had faced torture, he had faced betrayal, he had faced a fake trial, a mockery of a trial, and he had faced death, and he had overcome them all. There was nothing that we go through that Jesus did not go through and did not overcome, and they understood that they were in the hand of God and that nothing could touch them. They understood that as they walked through this life, Jesus was right there beside them, and so it took them years centuries even, before they came up to those formulations of the faith, those expressions of their experience that we call the creeds. But before that, they charged out in the world with just the joyful shout, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. They charged out with only that Hold, to hold on to only that, that they were basing everything on, everything that they did, everything that they were. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And so they understood, they knew that there was nothing in this world that they had to fear, that even were they to die, they were still in the hand of Jesus and he would still be with them, and he would overcome that, raise them to his side exactly as he had been raised by God. And therefore they were filled with joy, therefore they were filled with wonder, and therefore they were filled with power and were able to do more than they would have believed possible, more than anybody would have believed possible. In fact, says Paul, Jesus has been raised, and therefore, Therefore, he was filled with joy and power and wonder. You know, been watching the Olympics this past while, as I'm sure most of you are, totally impressed by the amazing things that those athletes do. It just boggles my mind that they survive what they try to do, let alone complete it. Wonderful. But I found myself thinking of one of the most powerful Olympic moments I have ever seen, and that was a long time ago. 
some of you may be too young to remember this. That was back in the 1996 Summer Olympics. And it was the final, I think, of the 400 meter relay or the 400 meter race, men's race. And Derek Redmond was running for the United States. And as they came around, as the runners came around the last corner, Derek tore a ligament, tore a tendon in his leg, and he fell to the ground. He just collapsed, fell right to the ground. And the rest of the runners, of course, kept going and they crossed the finish line. But Derek then stood up and he was trying to continue. He desperately wanted to finish the race. So he is hobbling up the track. He was in no state even to walk, let alone to run. There was no, it was heartbreaking to watch him. The whole, the stands and probably everybody watching on TV as I was, were just saying, you know, stop it. It hurts too much. Just lie down, sit there, wait till they come with a stretcher to take you. But he was determined. And he kept going. And then a man jumped over the fence, supporting, uh, separating the track from the observers, and ran, ran over to Derek and put his arm around him, put his, Derek's arm around his shoulder and helped him to, to the finish line. I think never been such a unanimous cheer at an Olympic moment. I cannot remember who won the race, but I will never forget who came in last in that moment. It was the most powerful thing I think that I have ever seen. And it strikes me that that is exactly an image for us. That is exactly the way that it is for us, that our Lord Jesus is with us always because he was raised and because he is alive and because he is at the right hand of God and because he is right beside us every day of our lives. He is able to help us, able to guide us, able to lead us, and therefore we are filled with joy. Sometimes Sometimes, who knows, sometimes he leads us and helps us to a goal. Sometimes it's just to get us across the finish line, but always with us to guide us, to lead us, to bless us. And when we understand that, when we know that, when we feel that in our hearts and in our minds and in our bodies, then we are filled with a joy and a peace that is beyond understanding. That is the heart of our faith. That is the joy that, that made this faith so attractive to all the people around the disciples. That's why they kept coming to them and listening to them gladly. They didn't always understand, but they listened to them gladly because the joy and the wonder of their lives was so attractive. And so it is for us because really and truly, we still shout out that same great shout of joy. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Amen. So let us confess this wonderful <coughs> faith in which we live as we say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. And on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love.
and infinite in mercy, <coughs> welcoming sinners and inviting them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. You hear me? We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake and they repent <laughs> for the sake of your son Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your servant, give you our most grateful thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for the incredible love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, and for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And here, we offer and present unto you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice to you. Eternal God, you are the strength of the weak and the comforter and sufferers. Receive all we offer you this day. Turn our sickness into health and our sorrow into joy. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Amen. We continue now as Tim leads us in. <clears throat> On this, the sixth day after Epiphany, with all our heart and mind, let us offer to God our prayer, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God. In Jesus, you have made the cursed shrub of desolation to be a tree of life. Cut us away from the trust in ourselves and water our parched and withered hearts with the streams of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh God, you brought life out of death through the Red Sea waters and through the death and resurrection of our Lord. Call all peoples of the world out of futile living and believing, that we may all hope and in your dominion of justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy One, in Jesus you touch the troubled and unclean. Reach out and touch all who are troubled. Heal our diseases. Remove the evil spirit of racism. Let your power cleanse us that we may sing praises to you alone. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, your mercy encompasses all creation. Stretch out your gracious hand, even as we deny and distort your presence in our midst. Fill us with the hunger which makes us dependent on you alone. May our lives extend your healing hand to all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, from creation to covenant, from prophets to present day, you have judged those who seek consolation in their positions. Bless us with the poverty which opens us to your dominion. Call us away from a life which hoards and squanders your creation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Abba God, you came to us little and vulnerable. Make us see and become one with the poor, that we may share in your dominion. Make us see and become one with the hungry, that we may find satisfaction in serving others. Lord, in your mercy. 
Hear our prayer. In the Greater Anglican Communion, we pray for the Nippon Sai Ko Kai. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the Director General of Community Ministries, the Reverend Canon Dr. P.J. Hobbs, and members of the uh, Community Ministries Committee. Also, we pray for Resurrection Lutheran Church and all who minister. As always, we pray for Linda, our primate, and our metropolitan, Shane, our bishop, and Rob, our priest. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for your healing hand and your healing grace for Leota, Shirley M., Barbara, Ethel, Judy, and Bill. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us, O God, tears of sorrow for this world. May our laughter grow out of trust that you are indeed Lord of heaven and earth. May we leap for joy in you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <clears throat> for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's sing again as we sing, Be Not Afraid.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. So remember, back to in-person worship next Sunday and our vestry meeting, which will start in about, say, 10 minutes. We'll have 10 minutes of coffee hour and then start our vestry meeting.